Dr. Bernard, yeah. I, I'm just、um, so grateful to God that we are able to have a conversation like this because 28th of March 2020 was such a momentous day. You were diagnosed with、uh, COVID 19, you had fever, chills, body aches, and many of us read the interview you gave with City News. You were in a very dark place. You had hallucination, having nightmares. It has somewhat like an out of body experience. Now, I think the first thing that is in all our members' hearts would be how are you feeling now? I feel fantastic. <laughs> you know, we, we, we never experience life with just part of us, it's always a complete experience spirit, soul, and body coming together. And I have to say, in the totality of my being, I'm in a very special place with God,、uh, with my health and my relationships and ministry. Doctor, you, you, you mentioned in the interview that you did with City News that、uh, you were low in your oxygen level, you were, you were really struggling, and you were in and out of consciousness, a little disoriented. And you mentioned that phrase that you're in a In a place of darkness, could you just explain to us a little bit more? Because it's so interesting. Now, what exactly was that? Well, darkness is metaphoric language, biblically speaking, for places of great challenge, places where we're, we don't have clarity of vision or understanding.、Uh, it's a place where we feel quite. I would say not uncomfortable, it's deeper than that. It's where you have to, like I did, abandon yourself to providence. I felt like I stared into the abyss、wow. of darkness and despair. And that darkness was not just、uh, mental and emotional, but it was spiritual. Wow. Because I felt deeply that there were spiritual forces at work. And I will tell you, As I spoke to some of my members and friends, there were certain intercessors who, on that very day, March the 28th, they experienced incredible spiritual warfare, and I was placed in their heart in the center of that warfare. So it was more than just catching COVID 19, it was deep spiritual warfare for me. And, and how do you come out of that? You, you mentioned about、uh, a verse from John chapter 1, right? Can you tell us a little bit more? Well, I, I will tell you, going through the hallucinations,、um, the loss of my、uh, taste and smell,、um, I began to get chills and my body trembled. And knowing that there's no vaccine, no treatment, Uh, that was official, and that I had a pre existing condition of asthma. And this particular virus attacks your lungs, your heart, your brain.、Uh, the biggest thing is blood clotting, and that's what would cause rapid death.、Uh, it was quite a challenge. I was in a place where,、um, especially with the hallucinations as well, that I. Abandoned myself to God's providence, His wisdom. I said, Lord, you're in charge of this. You know the outcome. And、uh, I'm, I'm in your hands. And I will tell you, that gave me peace. But it didn't give me strength. It gave me a sense of peace and comfort that whether I stay or go, I win. <laughs> you know, it's like Paul said if I stay, then. I continue in the victory of Christ. If, if I die, then I am be, I'm with Christ in his presence. So it's a win win situation for believers. And I then began to think of this overriding theme that was with me for three days, and that was darkness. And I began to reflect on the verse in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, where it says, The light shines in the darkness. And in the Amplified Bible, it nicely unpacks the shadows of meaning in the language. And 
it means that the darkness could not comprehend it. The darkness could not overpower it. The darkness could not absorb it, ally it. And I thought about that power that was Christ in me. And that light that could shine in the darkness of my experience. And I will tell you, when I unpack that passage, something deep and profound happened inside of me. It gave me strength. So abandoning myself to God's providence gave me peace. But what gives you peace doesn't necessarily give you strength. It took the scripture and the unpacking of that text that gave me strength and courage and filled me with joy. And then it led me to Jesus. And what he, I began to engage my imagination to what he experienced in the garden when he too peered into the darkness that he would have to face, the death that was ahead of him. He resolved that not on the cross. He resolved that in the garden. So when they came to arrest him, he was prepared, spirit, soul, and body, because he, he wrestled through the reality of the darkness that he was about to face when he would become that Passover lamb, that which would appease the offense of God from humanity and bring reconciliation and peace and, of course, a resurrection to new life. So I said, man, if I'm experiencing this, which is just a fraction of what Jesus experienced for the whole cosmos, the redemption of all of creation, I began to get blown away by the thought of that magnitude of darkness that I could never, never encounter or experience successfully. It takes God. And only God in the person of Jesus could face that the way he did. Dr. Bernard, you, you talk about um, uh, peace and you talk about strength. How can a normal Christian get that peace and the strength that you talk about? And in times of despair, in times of tragedy, loss, going through the grieving process, we look for hope. And hope becomes the anchor of our soul. And hope is a positive mindset, a positive state of thought and feeling and emotion that comes from positive expectations. And you can only have that when your hope is anchored in God. You don't look at the circumstances the way you would without hope. In uh, Romans chapter 4, it talks about Abraham, that he considered his own body. He considered that of his wife, Sarah. He considered the circumstances and situations, the realities of life. But it says he hoped against hope, which means when there seems to be no hope or things seem hopeless, he chose to believe and have faith anyway. Wow. And that becomes an anchor, the character of God, his immutability, his consistency in relationship to his covenant and his promises. And please understand when we use the term anchor, an anchor is designed to keep you within a certain radius. It doesn't exempt you from the storm. Wow. You are tied to the anchor, which is down. You're still on that water, in that boat, the storm, the waves, the wind, everything is hitting you. The anchor keeps you from being carried away by it. The anchor keeps you within a certain perimeter of experiencing it, but it keeps you centered where you should be so that you don't get away by it. So the anchoring of our soul does not exempt us from the tribulations, the trials, the realities of human experience, but it keeps us within a safe perimeter of trust and faith in God. Doctor, during this time, many people feel uh, isolated and lonely 
What would you say to people that are struggling with a sense of lostness? Like, how would you advise your own members in your church to keep on their uh, growing in their spiritual walk and their faith? How, what do you say to them? Well, I, it's a matter of how you utilize this time. Yes, we're humans. And as human beings, we are gregarious. We are social beings. We need physical touch, hug interaction when we separate or are separated we should use that time for introspection we should use that time to explore our interior life and begin to examine the weaknesses and the strength that exists within us and go to work on those things begin to build those things up begin to talk to god elevate our minds and our sense of being in relationship to God. So we're not really alone. When Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always, it expressed two things, proximity and participation. Proximity in that he would be there, present with them. But he wouldn't just be present, he would participate. He would be actively involved in their life, in their situation, in their circumstances, in their growth and development. So there are times that God separates us and uses the circumstances and situations to get our attention so that we listen to him and experience it, him in a way that we cannot and will not in an environment of busyness. And boy, the world is busy. We are in such movement and such activity that it takes discipline to slow down and to take time because we allow very little margin for that type of introspection. So COVID-19 put the brakes on everybody. <laughs> it began to teach us what we could live without, what we didn't really need in life, and reduced us to the essentials. It reduced us to what was really important. What do you think is important then? Our relationship with God first, family, the people who are most important in our lives, that we can find ourselves neglecting the richness of those relationships and building and strengthening those relationships. Things that we have put on hold that we wanted to achieve or accomplish and couldn't, we can begin to think about because we don't have all of the other distractions that tend to slow the process of achieving the things that we want to achieve. You see, I've got a positive mindset on this. I've got a mindset with positive expectations because I live in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is not only the rulership of the totality of my life as a servant to Christ, but it is a way of seeing and experiencing life. It's a comprehensive way of seeing life that informs my words, my thoughts, my motives, my actions, my attitudes, my choices. So I'm experiencing the kingdom in a new way, in a deep way, in a way that is detached from all of the distractions. How do you feel the world will be like once this COVID-19 pandemic season is over? If I ask you to look prophetically down the road by two years, three years, how do you think the church will be like moving on from this pandemic? I think we're going to have to go through a process to figure out what the new normal will be. We don't know. We're all trying to figure it out. But if anyone says we've got it, they don't. And if we think that we can simply revert back to the way things were, we're missing it big time. It's going to take a blend of the physical experience in the building and the digital experience that has now, you know, gotten people accustomed to doing things quite differently. In terms of the world at large, when we have this kind of upheaval within society where we get stripped where all of the social institutions that kept our attention are shut down even the church right 
we begin to see life differently because all of these things are taken away. We begin to start thinking about, well, gosh, what's really important? We start thinking about purpose. We start thinking about structure. We start thinking about relationships. We start thinking about identity. It's true for the individual. It's true for the church corporately, the church locally. It's true for society at large. Who do we want to be? What are our core values? What do we believe in? What drives us as a people? So for me, this is wonderful. This is revival. Revival is, is, is the renewal of, of, of creativity and, and, and fervence and, and, and towards purpose. Revival is when we begin to examine the people who are in our spaces. We begin to examine how our lives are arranged because however you arrange your life creates a rhythm and that rhythm establishes a pattern. And if that pattern is not wholesome and building and developing your life and your walk with God, then you need to change how your life is arranged. So I will tell you, I love this period that we're in. It is amazing. But then that's through my lens. So, Doctor, you don't think God is angry with the world and that's why all these things happening or God has given up on us? I don't know what God that may be, but it's not my God. <laughs> uh, God has been consistent. From the book of Genesis, he opens up and he says, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. That fails, not because of him, but because of humanity. He raises up a man, hundreds of, well, over, over 2,000 years later, and he makes him a promise that he's going to build a society through him that will have a special relationship. He raises up a Moses. He brings it to pass. And what does he say to them? I'll make you the head and not the tail. I'll place you above and not beneath. People will be jealous of you because of the relationship that you have with your God. So that promise remained the same. And what happened? That failed. So he raises up Jesus. And what does Jesus come? What's his message? I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So the message has been consistent right to the end of the book. The book ends with a promise of a new heaven, a new earth, wiping away all tears, wiping away all pain. His overall delight for humanity is to bring the beauty that he intended originally in the Garden of Eden. So in spite of human failures, all right, he has an objective, and that objective is to have a society that loves God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loves their neighbor as their self. Doctor, what will you say to someone who is watching this interview and who has lost a job, lost the dream, lost a lot of finances, lost a career? What, what do you say to a person like that right now? Yeah, I will say to them that they are probably in a place of grief. They're grieving a loss. And there are stages that we go through. It's called the five stages of grief. We all experience that grief differently. So don't let anyone tell you how you should grieve, how long you should grieve, but do help you work through it, walk through it. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. He was letting his disciples know that they will still have to deal with the realities of life. Sickness, disease, death, loss, failure, success, joy, sadness. All of those realities of life will be their reality. But he said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Which means that in spite of the realities that they have to face, God is still present and he's going to do something about it. And what they need to do is pay attention to discern his hand, his voice, his movement. Well, Doctor, you, you, you mentioned in your interview that you really believe that in this season that we could have a God-inspired revival, a reawakening of passion. So how can we enter into that, that reawakening, that revival here in Singapore, in City Harvest Church? That is stirred by the Holy Spirit and requires a cause. 
whether that cause is around rebuilding lives, rebuilding institutions, rebuilding families, rebuilding communities, rebuilding spiritual communities. We are cause driven as a people and especially the millennial generation and the generation Z, they love a cause. They rally behind a cause. So if we take up a cause, get excited about it, that's going to bring beauty and love and life and light to human society, what the, the term in, amongst the Hebrew culture is tikkun olam, repairing the world and our responsibility to use our gift, talents and ability to help repair this world, to make it a better place. We're not going to make it completely wonderful and perfect. Only Christ is going to do that when he returns. But we can make it a lot easier to deal with the negative realities by bringing the positive into it. I believe that wholeheartedly. Wow. Doctor, you, you've been consistent all this while in your teaching, in your doctrine, in your theology about bringing Christ into culture, right? Yes, absolutely. So this is a possibly to you a great time for us to bring the gospel, to bring Christ into our situation, into our culture. Now, what would you say to an average cell group of, say, 10, 20 people? How could they make a difference and bring Christ into culture during this pandemic? With all these boundaries, you've got to stay at home. There's little social interaction. What can we do to make a difference right now? You know, it is times like this that God squeezes the creativity out of us because that's what it calls for. Creativity, innovation should excite us. The opportunities that are presented to us because of the problems that are around us. Who will be that shining light? Who's going to come up with the idea that is going to change the way people feel and think about what's going on. This is a wonderful time. I'm a contrarian. When the stock market is down, I go fishing, bottom fishing. I look for what's available. What can I pour into? What can I grow and develop? You know, that's redemptive thinking. And God is all about redeeming humanity, not judging. Jesus said, I didn't come to, to, to destroy the world, to judge the world. No, he said, I came that you will be saved. He came to bring salvation. He came to, begin, to bring his love and his life and his light so that man could experience it in such a way that nothing else could satisfy. Wow, doctor, that's amazing. That's amazing. Can we backtrack a little bit now? And let's, let's go back to uh, more personal strain and that is um, what is your personal takeaway out of this entire COVID pandemic especially in the in the light of your near-death experience death reminds us of the brevity of life and the fact that we've been given a gift talent ability purpose time, space, relationships, resources, with the expectation that we'll make a difference in this world. So it is times like these where the need is greatest that there's a demand for us to make a difference. You know, there's your calling, right? That for which you were designed and empowered by God to do. There is your occupation. That's what you do to pay the rent, to pay the bills. But then there's an important question. There's your mission. Your mission asks the question, what does the world demand from me? What does the world need that I have been designed to respond to? And man, when you start thinking like that, now you're flying with the eagles. You have now entered a place of transcendence. And when you're elevated like that and you're thinking, the landscape looks different. You begin to change your approach to life, to yourself, to God, to people, to everything. And I think that's what we're being called to, a higher dimension 
of existence, a higher place. See, and that comes from a deeper connection with God. Do you see any、um, radical change in the way you do life and ministry now after March the twenty eighth? Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I have a heightened awareness of God's presence, a heightened awareness of His providence and appreciation for that, a a a passion to utilize my gift, talents, and abilities and build relationship. And think about this: there have been several pandemics over the last two thousand years: the bubonic plague, black plague, the hundred years ago. The Spanish flu, 50 million people died. We have this pandemic. We have the Justinian plague. So over the last 2,000 years, all right, that Christianity has been present here, present here on the earth, there have been major diseases and impacted, and millions of lives were lost. But if you look back at history, you will find that after each one of them, new innovations, inventions, advance. Society, human society, in ways that they were not advancing prior to that. Out of what happened with the Black Plague, it was the precursor to the Industrial Revolution that would follow. Because when man is challenged like that and shaken, he comes to a place where he doesn't want to ever return to that. So he starts thinking, "What can we do to make it different?" So you have inventions like the the the, the bathroom, <laughs> because that was a big problem in in Europe with the, with with the Black Plague. All right, the sewage. They began to think about how can we recreate sewer systems? How can we create ways that people can use the bathroom and not throw it out the window in the front yard? So after every crisis like this in civilization historically. New inventions, new innovations, new systems and structures come into play. That's how we respond, and I believe that God uses those opportunities to inject civilization with answers to problems, to questions that we've struggled with for so long, and society accelerates closer and closer to the culmination of human history when God returns. You know, Doctor Bernard, you have been such a mentor to me and to Sun for so many years. So many years. How do you, how do you like City Harvest during this time, as a church, to be creative? How do you see our church, say, three years from now, five years from now? How do I see City Harvest? Right. I think that what's going to happen. Think about, think about this. There's a friend of mine. He is a pastor in Knoxville, Tennessee. He has a church of about 500 members. They are tend to be affluent members, so he's able to do a lot more financially. But only 500. Since he has been online because of COVID, he is now reaching 3,000 people a week. Churches are expanding their reach, expanding. Their contact globally, so when they go back in, all right, they have to now figure out how do we satisfy the people that need and want the corporate worship experience in the four walls of a building, and at the same time continue to expand what has been expanding as a result of a digital presence. They're going to have to figure all of that out. So we have to think bigger. We have to think wider. And I think that our growth is now decentralized. No longer tens of thousands coming into one space. No, it's decentralized growth. It's spread out. How do we keep people connected? Keep them growing. Build them, strengthen them, inform them, educate them, direct them in such a an expanding platform. What would you say is the is the right balance of wisdom for City Harvest Church? How should we really negotiate this coming back or having the online experience? I will say, listen to the medical experts. They know what they're talking about. Follow. Protocol, and see, this is the deception. Because here we're talking about 
you know, 25% of your capacity and then 50% and then we work our way up. But people are, I would say, misunderstanding what it means to re-enter right now. Because if you re-enter and start having services, even with 25% of your seating capacity, it's not going to be the same experience that you're used to. You have to take temperature when they come in. You have to wear face masks. You have to be separated at a distance of six feet. You have to be at least 25 to 30 feet from the stage where any singing is going on because the physics of fluid says that when you are singing, you're forcing more air, which carries those drops a great greater distance than when you're having a conversation. It's anywhere from 12 to 18 feet. So you have to think of all of this. And with the mask, with the distance, you're not going to be experiencing what you thought in terms of community and closeness. It's a whole different experience than what you may think. And they've got to realize that. Doctor, what about faith? What about we got to step up by faith and trust God that no weapon formed against us shall prosper? <laughs> Faith is a reasoned trust. It is not blind at all. We may use faith to navigate dark spaces, but it's not blind. It's a reasoned trust. So reason is critical. And we have to be careful because too often this can, be, this can get so emotional that we tend to deny our emotions the benefit of our intellect. God gave us the power to think. Emotion provides passion, but intellect guides actions. Those two things must work together, not by themselves. Wow. Doctor, thank you so much. I think it, this has been such an enriching time. When we go back into the building, all right, we're not going to go full force. We are noticing that we have more people in our congregation plugged in and engaged with the building closed than when we had the building open. Because of Zoom webinars, because of remote experience, more people are attending classes, more people are uh, attending the men's meetings online, the, 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 the women's meeting, the marriage meetings. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. We have a daily morning prayer call, Monday through Friday, for an hour, and our ministers are praying. We have a thousand people every morning within that hour praying together. It's amazing what has come out of this whole experience. Our staff have been forced to become creative to respond to the need to keep people connected. And I'm excited about it. Wow. Doctor, if you can say the last word to encourage all our members right now, what will you say to us as a church? Hope in the character of God, His consistency, His immutability becomes the anchor for our soul. This is a time, this is an opportunity for you to really draw close to God. Prayer is the elevation of the heart, the mind, the spirit to a place of a deeper awareness of God's presence. And I will tell you, the more conscious you are of his presence, it is amazing how that affects you spiritually, emotionally, and even physically and psychologically. So I would say work on that awareness. Dig deep into the scripture. Avail yourself of the time and opportunity given to you to study, to pray, to share, to interact. Yes, we're not in the building, but the church hasn't closed. The church has continued to be open. We are still doing community, but we're doing it differently. And it's making us have a greater appreciation of when we do come together, 
When we do fellowship, when we do hug and lay hands and interact with each other and greet each other. But for now, this is a time for deep, deep quality time with God, with the Holy Spirit, examining our sense of purpose, what's important, what's valuable. Take the time to reflect on those things. And I will tell you, it's often in the midst of that kind of reflection that we move away from worry. And all of a sudden, we begin to see God actively involved in changing our circumstances in ways that we couldn't detect him before because we were blinded by the loss, blinded by the worry, blinded by the fear. Fear and unbelief work together. That's why Jesus said, why are you so fearful, O oh, you of little faith? Those things work together. So bring faith, bring trust, bring belief into it. You have the power to do that. You have the quality of reason and thought. And now's the time to exercise that. Doctor, that is so good. Thank you so much. Will you say a prayer for all the members of City Harvest Church and all those in the Harvest Network that are watching this broadcast all throughout the region and around the world? Wow. Let me say this to City Harvest Church and to you. If anything, your church has demonstrated over the last five years is the power of resilience, faith, trust, persistence because at the end of the day here you are beyond that season in your life and in the life of the church and you can sit here in the freedom of christ smile and shepherd this congregation into the future wow absolutely amazing that was god only with the spirit of god the power of god could you have that supernatural resilience against the things that you've been through? So I commend you for not becoming bitter about everything, but embracing God's providence in your life and knowing that this is a new season and a new beginning, not only for you, but for your family and for City Harvest Church. Amen. So, Lord, thank you that you don't need evil in order to bring about good, but you do use evil to bring about a greater good. Thank you for the greater good that you foresaw years ago for City Harvest, for Pastor Kang, for this leadership, and for this relationship. So, Lord, I pray that there will be an awakening of passion, fervor, and creativity towards purpose, the purpose of your kingdom, bringing Jesus, his love, his life, and his light to a very needy and fearful world. Thank you that you are indeed the anchor of our soul the character of the mutability, consistency, that you are God and you change not, and your commitment and desire for us is still the same, that we may have life and that we might have it more abundantly. So, Father, let the people of City Harvest Church, the cell group leaders, leadership at every level, the executive leadership, let them come alive with curiosity that fuels creativity and innovation to look at the future and say, how can we capture this future? How can we take what we've been through and make it better? How can we keep people connected, deepen and broaden those connections? Lord, I pray that the spirit of witty inventions, the spirit of wisdom, discernment, 
will rest upon Pastor Kong and Pastor Sun as they shepherd this congregation out into the new normal, into the new future that only you know how great it will be. So we trust you with it. We thank you for it. And we're excited about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.